My biggest worry with the entire premise of Whole Cake Island was that we were putting a lot of pressure on Sanji. From a storytelling perspective, he's a pre-established character, and adding story to a pre-established character is very tricky. And while sure, we have gotten a few hints of his past, that's not a lot. So while I haven't finished reading Whole Cake Island, I'm up to here for reference because I thought this was a strong place to stop because I already have a lot that I want to say. Before I talk about Sanji though, I gotta talk about another amazing cook because Oda is cooking. Let's talk about Whole Cake Island. I think one of the difficult things about these longer arcs is that without a lot of change, it can very quickly get stagnant. I want to say that there's this bell curve where at the start we want to learn so much about the islands and then as we go through the arc, we learn all it has to offer and then there's still this hefty chunk of the arc that is usually dedicated to fighting. I think at the moment, Whole Cake Island has addressed this by island hopping, and I think it makes sense given how we are still technically exploring one territory, but there's just a lot more diversity. So far there's the Chocolate Island, we got the woods, we got the Kingdom of Jerma, the forest, the uh, mere dimension world. There's a lot more opportunities to really showcase and be placed in very diverse landscapes. It also helps that when we want to, we can still have all of the frosting and candy aesthetics, but just tone it down a notch and have us be on practically normal terrain. This arc is also very introspective. Not only is it backstory lore heavy with Sanji, but the entire arc itself is different, right? The original intent of the arc is simply just to get in, get Sanji, and get out. What really caught my attention in this arc was how much Big Mom expected all of this to happen. Not just that Sanji would try to leave and came up with the explosion cuffs, but also how the crew would try to get him back. And as a result, sent a group after Luffy and Nami before they can even see Big Mom. A lot of the downfall of other antagonists came from simply underestimating what Luffy was trying to do, and what makes Big Mom such an antagonizing character is the fact that as an emperor, she has the knowledge to predict a lot of these moves. Big Mom, unlike practically everyone else that Luffy has fought, really did not underestimate Luffy. Everyone has tried this before. The witch even says that, oh, everyone thinks that they're all that, but then here... Even the underlings of the Emperors are strong. Here, Big Mom plans to make sure that you die before you can even see Sanji or Big Mom. This isn't the first time that she's seeing someone claiming to be the Pirate King because Emperors are really familiar with this type of character and know how to handle him. As a character though, I want to say that Big Mom feels very hypocritical. On the one hand, she has this dream of creating a land without discrimination with everyone in it. And on the other hand, she is quite literally objectifying people and trying to add them into her personal collection. On the one hand, she wants to have people grow up as big as she is and have this tea party and see eye to eye. And on the other hand, she is willing to kill anyone to do it and wants to have the final say on anything. I don't know, I just find it weird. There is so much contrast with her character. On the one hand, she wants people to live happily and have a tea party. We see like this very colorful, uh, clearly childlike environment with humanized objects. And then on the other hand, we see the lengths that she's willing to go through to get what she wants. We see bloodshed and cities being pillaged over a tea party. Big Mom is a fascinating character, especially as an emperor. Also, um... I don't, I don't want to linger on this too much, but can we talk, can we, can we talk about Big Mom's statistics? Like the fact that she had 85 kids and 43 different husbands? We see that some of them are minks, some of them are fishmen, some of them could be giants. Um, that, that's pretty crazy. Anyways, I, I find this interesting because in a world full of self-described conquerors, Big Mom is strategically growing her crew and tying that bond with marriage. Even though it was quote unquote the way of growing power historically, especially when you consider the age of piracy era in the real world, I find it interesting that in One Piece it is a refreshing way to do things. While we're at it, let's talk about Jerma. We got the Kingdom of Jerma described as a kingdom without land that can attend the reverie. 
which right off the bat creates a ton of interesting questions. I thought that maybe Jerma might have controlled territory in the sea specifically, so that's why it was praised. But what we see is that Jerma is a very unique kingdom in One Piece. It is a seafaring kingdom of interlocking ships. That's cool! That thing's like a more complex version of Thriller Bark. And what makes it even more unique is that I think it's the only kingdom and ship that we've seen capable of freely scaling the red line. It's been fascinating to see how all these world building points have accumulated. We have uh, Germa 66 being a very technologically advanced nation. We then use that to connect it to Vegapunk. We then use that to connect it to bloodline elements, which is like a way of enhancing humans. We have seen a lot of high-tech advancements in One Piece, Jerma being the leading edge of one. Vegapunk, I think, being at the peak of that before he was practically kidnapped by the world government and made to work with them. Uh, that's kind of the phrasing that Jerma seems to be going with, and I don't doubt it. We see a ton of biological experiments. All of Sanji's relatives are wearing what's practically like a Power Ranger outfit, which, to be fair, does go pretty hard. Jerma 66 managed to end an entire war, and I love the contrast between the war is over, thank you, as we just see the scene of fire and chaos in Broccoli Island. What I'm seeing, though, is that we're getting an entire arc thematically tied to family, in which the families are abusive and controlling over each other. Sanji and the girl he's getting married to are mostly tools used to form bigger ideas, whether it's to rule over North Blue or to increase the strength of Big Mom's army. Both of them also don't care who's under their control. Big Mom, without hesitation, will destroy her own civilization, and Sanji's father will easily kill his own people. Man, Sanji's family is messed up. Let's talk about him. First up, we got the dad, a person who seems hyper-obsessed with his own legacy. We've seen inherited will be a huge theme of One Piece, passing down the torch. But I think and kind of hope that Sanji's dad will showcase this idea of rejecting will with Sanji managing to find a way to reject and leave his father. A lot of his actions, like when he's being proud of his own children, are really only an extension to how close he is to achieving what he wants. And if his kids aren't what he expects them to be, then it turns into a Sanji situation, where he is punished, isolated, and bullied for being human. We also have his brothers, which I'm just going to lump together. Yeah, one of them's more self-aware, the other one's a little bit more hot-headed. Whatever! So far, these brothers have worked in unison, with their ideologies being very close to how celestial dragons think. It is this self-absorbed, thinking highly of yourself and down to others mentality. With Sanji's sister being the only one who is at the very least empathetic, she's kind of in a similar boat in the sense that she really can't escape from her situation. She acts the way she does in order to blend in with the others, and she stays silent in a lot of the harsher moments where the brothers are interacting with Sanji. Let's also talk about Sanji for a second, because as soon as we focused on Sanji, all of my worries were gone. Instantly, I was like, yeah, okay, this isn't going to be a hard 180 turn, especially when we dive into the more backstory and introspective moments of this arc. Here for this arc, while you can occasionally show the more sim side of Sanji, I think the more serious nature of this arc and Sanji's personal conflict with being trapped in an abusive situation instead allows Oda to highlight my favorite aspect of Sanji, which is his chivalry. Chivalry plays a pretty big role in this arc. It is used to highlight the differences between Sanji and the rest of the Vinsmoke family. It is used to highlight what his actual father taught him to be kind and honorable. Zeph is also used to further emphasize something that Sanji had already been embedded with. So I like this writing technique where instead of using the past to showcase new aspects of Sanji, we are instead using it to further strengthen these pre-existing traits of Sanji. We get a glimpse of kid Sanji being a lot more sympathetic and physically weaker than his siblings. And we see how that shifts his focus into attempting to be better at something that is not physical, like cooking. In fact, let's talk about Sanji's mom for a quick second because there's just so much heart in this one scene with Sanji talking to his mom who is willing to try this pretty gross food, I'm gonna be honest. Where the mom claims that, no, it is actually delicious, and I think this is a cheat. You can't do this, okay? I'm gonna, I'm gonna say it. It made me cry. 
and I don't approve. But if there was ever a moment that made Sanji want to keep cooking, this would definitely be up there. I also absolutely adore this scene later on where Sanji's brother throws food at the cook and spills it all over the floor. It is extremely dramatic, but the strength of the scene really comes from seeing Sanji understand the value of nutrition that is derived from this food, coupled with the understanding to not throw that food away. Again, coming from a very ingrained moment in his childhood. So a huge reason why Sanji's even staying here in the first place was because he's been backed into a corner. There's a lot of stakes riding on this marriage for people Sanji cares about, and up to this moment, Sanji's been having a lot of conflicting thoughts about what to do. And a really big moment in this arc is the Sanji versus Luffy fight, and oh boy, oh boy do I have, do I have some emotions about this one. You know, when we were back in the forest and there was a mirror world and we saw Luffy versus Luffy, I was thinking, oh, wow, wouldn't it be cool for the Straw Hats to fight each other? Man, that would be fun. But no, that's not what this is. This fight is very painful. Emotionally. This is Sanji desperately trying to make sure everyone he knows is safe. It's him trying to quickly sever ties to not make himself look suspicious. It is him trying to push away Luffy in a way that won't make Luffy double down, which Luffy ends up doing anyways. The most painful part about this entire section is Sanji knowing that he has to push Luffy away and Luffy's unwillingness to do so. Even after he's been quote unquote defeated, he still refuses to leave Sanji. <laughs> Luffy, Luffy's saying, I'd rather starve than leave. I refuse to eat anything but you're cooking again. And meanwhile, I'm just here crying in the corner reading this like, yeah, yeah, you tell him, get, get back your cook. <laughs> I had to, I had to walk away from this one for a while, you know, just, uh, whew. let's, uh, let's talk about some other things. Yeah. Uh, so there are, <laughs> um, here's some side notes of things that I find weird, but didn't really know where to include. For example, Capone is seen having a family with a woman we saw back in Thriller Bark. A lot of the comments back in Zoe told me that he was simply teaming up because that is what you do in the new world. But see, I think Capone didn't willingly team up. I think he folded. I don't think an upstarting rookie willingly travels along the Grand Line into the new world with the goal of being an underling. I think Capone ran into Big Mom and knew his situation, and this might have been his best play. We know that if you want a road poneglyph, you're gonna have to get close with an emperor anyways. He mentioned not being a person who didn't separate business from personal life, so I legitimately think that this could just be business. With Jinbei, we also saw the mermaid shark, which was the daughter of Big Mom's family. We didn't get to see too much of her, but I just like the exposition about the survivability of leaving Big Mom's crew, which apparently is very low, and her willingness to do it if that's what the plan was. While I'm at it, I also wanted to talk about a lot of the scale of these things. When all the Jerma ships are showing up and interlocking and we're supposed to see how big an epic Jerma kingdom is supposed to be, we totally forget about Whole Cake Island being right behind it. It is to such a scale that it's not even a place anymore. It's just part of the environment. It is looming over everything. Okay, so how do I think the second half of Whole Cake Island is going to turn out, huh? Well, a big section of the story that I haven't talked about has been Brooke's team and Chopper's team. So far, Brooke's team has not done anything, but... I can see a very strong thing happening because on the one hand we have Big Mom, the person who is capable of taking people's souls. She is able to suck up people's souls and put them into other objects. And on the other hand, we have Brooke, who is literally the soul king. Now, I don't know if this really means that we're going to see like a soul versus soul battle. If we're going to see Brooke take the other minions or convert him to his team. You can take this idea in so many different directions. And if that does not play a role <laughs> at all, I'm going to be upset. As for Chopper's team... Chopper and Karika trapped in the mirror dimension, and if they get out, that's, that's fine. 
And if not, Chopper and Carrot are at the very least in a really advantageous position to see information from other mirrors, to give information to those outside of mirrors. So contacting Sanji is a really good one. Pulling him into the mirror dimension is another good one. Maybe stealing a key for Sanji's arm thing. Because simply leaving with Sanji isn't an option anymore because people nearby to Sanji are gonna be in trouble as well. So I don't know how we would be able to do this without fighting Big Mom this arc. Either way, you know, you gotta deal with the problem and then maybe take Pudding. I don't know, she seems nice. After all, Pudding helped Luffy get out of essentially destroying an establishment. Luffy was fully aware that he was destroying someone's property, but he just, he just kept going. And we know that she's being heavily oppressed by Big Mom, so I think it would be pretty interesting to see her jump on board. We already have such a weird cast. Why why not add her? Anyways, I'm gonna go read the second half of this arc. Thanks to all my patrons who have been in a week-long eating contest attempting to consume the entirety of Whole Cake Island. I feel like at some point, the food's gotta go bad, so if anything, you're not really competing with each other to see who can eat the most food. You're instead competing against the food before it gets bad. Anyways, I'll be back like in a week. Eat the entire island. I believe in you. Bye.